Hi! So today I wanted to talk a little bit about the gendered brain or blue versus pink brains. And it was mainly inspired by this book from Gina Rippon called The Gendered Brain. And after reading this, I kind of rediscovered how much controversy there still is around this topic. So that's why today I want to dive a little bit deeper into this topic and really find out what neuroscience can actually say about brain differences between the two genders and how much we actually know. And I do highly recommend you to read the book by Gina Rippon because I think it's one of the books that really talks about some of the problems in the field. So the idea that male brains and female brains are different has been around before we even could do proper brain studies. As a skilled practitioner of phrenology, I will now feel your brain. Typical female structure, underdeveloped for arts and sciences, stronger for religion and care of children. And in general, it is actually a question of causality. So in neuroscience, we can of course see that brains of females and males are different, but this is not only because these brains were different from the beginning, but also because males and females live different lives. So in a gendered world, it makes sense that our brains are gendered because the lives we lead are actually reflected in our brains. So for example, it has been shown that for people that drive taxis, that in their hippocampus, the visual spatial area was a little bit more developed or there was more gray matter in this area than for participants that didn't drive taxis. And this is just to show that differences in brains will occur if we lead different lives. And in the end, the whole discussion of gender differences in the brain is a little bit more nuanced in the sense that we don't on only want to find differences. We want to see if they're causal from our birth, so mostly related to our genes, or if they're more created by our environment. And this question is actually a lot harder to answer than you might think, and it has actually not been answered yet. So neurosexism or gender differences are not new and still widely supported today. And the reason that neuroscience today still finds gender differences so easily or so prevalently is because of three different reasons according to Gina Rippon. So first in neuroscience, differences are just more easily published than finding no differences. So for example, if your null hypothesis is that female brains and male brains are equal and you find that they are not equal, so you can reject your null hypothesis with a p-value of 0.05. This is such a way more interesting finding than finding that the brains of males and females are actually equal. And the second biggest problem was that early brain imaging and even now today showed images that for the general public seem to be very easy to understand. So for example they showed images in differences in fMRI signal or in MRI structural matter in the brain between two groups and as someone that is not trained in MRI or in neuroimaging data analysis these images seem quite easy to interpret but if you actually look at the details underlying these images you will see that most of them have been created with super complex mathematical models or with highly evolved statistics and it's actually quite hard to interpret these images but yeah they have been used by the general media as a very easy way to show differences. But and the last big problem with research in gender data is that usually their conclusions are made in a causal sense such that we have female brains thus we do this instead of considering that we live in a gendered world and thus our brains reflect this gendered world and due to detangle actually this nature from nurture debate is at the moment kind of impossible with neuroscience research because the only data we have is correlational so anytime someone makes any type of causal argument one way or the other you actually cannot really do this from the type of data we have now so usually this is then an over interpretation of the data so yeah these are the three big problems that have been occurring in neuroscience in general and are also very prevalent in the gendered data. But I want to dive a little bit deeper into the book because her chapters and her titles and all the research she presents is amazing. So the first chapter is called Inside Her Pretty Little Head, The Hunt Begins and the hunt here being the hunt for differences. And this chapter kind of dives deep into the field we actually started from. So neuroscience originated a little bit more from psychology and uh, philosophy 
philosophical debates because we didn't really have the machinery beforehand to really research gender differences. So a lot of the research that or research that was done was a little bit more speculative and a little bit more based on what people saw in actual practice or in behavioral data. So I want to read a quote from the book that was written by Gustave Le Bon just to show you how yeah, awful actually uh, some of the statesmen were at that time. Charles Marie Gustave Le Bon was a leading French polymath whose areas included anthropology, psychology, sociology, medicine, invention and physics. So one of the things he said was, without a doubt there exists some distinguished women very superior to the average man, but they are as exceptional as the birth of any monstrosity, as for example of a gorilla with two heads. Consequently, we may neglect them entirely. So yeah, the um, existence of highly intelligent women were as controversial as the existence of gorillas with two heads. And of course this was written quite a while ago, but our origins do lie in some of the thinkers that had these very dichotomizing beliefs. And I think this is quite important to realize that the culture scientists come from is not always unbiased. And these kind of biases can be quite prevalent even if the data doesn't really support them. So then Gina Rippon dives a little bit into another controversial topic which is now deemly stated as neuro trash and this is mostly very early on problems with neuroscience as a field because something that a lot of people forget is that neuroscience is actually a really young field so a lot of things that were published 10 20 or 30 years ago have already been shown to not be true anymore or counter research was proposed so i want to dive a little bit into mri and fmri so mri is magnetic resonance imaging and with mri you can do an fmri sequence and the idea of fmri MRI sequence is that it's a proxy for neural activity. So it's worth to note what fMRI at the moment can tell us and what it can actually not tell us. And from that you will have a way more informed understanding of what neuroscience can do at the moment versus what it cannot do. So functional magnetic resonance imaging or functional fMRI measures brain activity by detecting changes with blood flow. Then is blood oxygenation level dependent contrast techniques or called bold and bold reflects changes in regional cerebral blood flow volume and or oxygenation so it's an indirect measure to measure brain activity and the idea is then that an increase in local neural activity stimulates both higher energy consumption and increased blood flow and this already is quite hard to interpret because what it exactly means when someone has an increased blood flow or a higher energy consumption in a certain brain area is not entirely clear because you can imagine for example that when you just start using a certain brain area like you're learning a new language and you activate a brain area more or there's more blood flow going to this brain area or a higher oxygen consumption maybe that means you're actually a novice in this language or it could mean that when you're an expert you actually use this area more but we've also seen that with experts sometimes activities decrease in a certain area so to really understand what what actually the fMRI signal means is quite subtle and different debates are still going on about it. Yeah, so I will put a paper down below that discusses it a little bit more, but it's a quite a nuanced argument, whereas in popular media it's usually just written like, oh, this area of the brain is activated more and what we cannot measure directly at least with fMRI neural brain activity. So this is already um, kind of bollocks, right? And another big study or a big controversy that I want to discuss a little bit was the dead salmon study. So the dead salmon study was there was a group that put a salmon into the fMRI or in the MRI machine and afterwards they saw there was actually some brain activity in this dead salmon. And this of course is impossible so I will discuss a little bit of why did ha this happened. So when you do studies with fMRI usually there there's a lot of information and the brain is generally broken down into tiny sections that are called voxels. And these voxels can be up to a hundred thousand for a single study. And usually when we want to see if one voxel is activated, we compare them to another. And then we do statistics on every voxel to see if they are activated or not. So in general you have over a thousand comparisons and then you run into something that is called the multi-comparison problem. And with the multi-comparison problem, 
this means that usually when you do a lot of tests, some of them will come out as positives or false positives, even if they are not truly positive. So it will show activity in a brain that is actually dead. And what you have to do then is a multi-comparisons correction. And now in the field, we're super aware of this, but actually when this study came out or this was actually a poster, it was shown that 25 to 40% of the studies during that time didn't correct their fMRI studies for this multiple comparison. And this is not to say that all these studies were false, but more to show that the statistics needed for fMRI studies is quite delicate. And even experts in the field sometimes use it incorrectly. And then if you want to show differences between two genders using fMRI, this can cause for a lot of strange results if you don't use the correct statistics. So yeah, I've already given you a little bit of a feel of this nature versus nurture. In our book, she then, Gina Rippen then dives a little bit deeper into this debate. And with MRI studies, what you would then like to do is to go before the nurture has actually taken place. So you would kind of, in an optimal case scenario, measure baby brains that haven't been exposed to the outside world. So a lot of studies that are done in gender research have been done on babies. But Gina Rippen kind of makes an argument that a lot of these studies are also overconfident in the conclusions they show because babies have one of the most highly adaptable brains. So even tiny gender cues from our outside environment could change their brains quite rapidly. So in general, our brains are rule-seeking systems generating predictions based on the world in which they are functioning in order to guide us through that world. So in order to understand. So this is again that Bayesian brain idea where we make predictions and update our priors by the information from the outside. And given the relentless gender bombardment from social and cultural media that is evident in the 21st century, the associated stereotypes are likely to become much more frequently primed and embedded in our understanding of the social requirements. So in general, the toys we surround us with, the gender stereotypes, movies on how a girl or a boy is supposed to behave, and also pinkification. So pinkification is this kind of insidious term that is used to describe that everything girls use and women use has to be pink. So for example, if I want to use a hammer, I can of course not use a normal hammer. I have to use a pink hammer because I'm a woman. She gives a really funny example of this STEM Barbie doll that was created to stimulate the interest of girls to become scientists. But what could this STEM Barbie doll create? It was a pink washing machine, a pink rotating wardrobe and a pink jewelry carousel. And I mean, I don't have anything against pink. I think pink is a lovely color, but this does show that we divide our genders in our world quite strictly, even from a really young age. And I think you can see this even better in, for example, these gender reveal parties, where even before a baby is born, we already place them in their appropriate gender box. So then the tangling nature from nurture is even impossible with very early brains. So even with baby brains, it's quite hard to really see what the differences in the brains of boys and girls mean if they are already exposed to our gendered world. And this is not to say that nature doesn't play a big role or that nurture doesn't play a big role, but it's just to say that with the data we have, we cannot really make conclusive statements right now. So the last thing I kind of really wanted to talk about and which is also discussed in the book is sex and science or gender in science. And I really want to dive into this topic a little bit because some of the professors and some psychologists that I personally follow and really admire actually make arguments that are very similar to the one I'm going to make soon and that are actually kind of faulty in the way that they are constructed. So I want to walk you through the argument and kind of see what your opinion on it is to see if you agree or disagree with it. But hopefully it will be an interesting argument for you to follow. So something that I've heard a lot come up lately is that in the West, we are moving away from gender norms. Our society is becoming more gender free in the sense that it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you will have the same choices in your life. And what we actually see is in the West that there's actually a trend for women to move away from STEM field choices. So most women actually do not go to the more hard science such as mathematics, physics, 
or even neuroscience and move more towards languages and social sciences. And the argument then goes something like this, that if women have more freedom, they actually go more towards their natural setting in towards social sciences or towards language studies. Whereas if men have more freedom, which they always had a lot of freedom, I suppose, but if men have also the same equal amount of opportunities, they move more towards STEM type of fields. Okay, so with this argument, it starts from the notion that we are moving towards a gender-free world, or at least a world where gender doesn't matter as much in the choices we make. And I think already if you know a little bit about um, the world and where we live in, you will see that gender is actually still quite prevalent. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gender reveal parties. But Gina Rippon actually says about this argument, you might think that it's only after years of exposure to negative stereotypes of women's intellectual capacities that your ever helpful predictive brain might pick up on the idea that, on a whole, women don't do science. Or the idea that those who do are not going to go far. And anyways, you'll be very lonely and isolated if you put yourself in sciencey situations. Sadly though, fledgling versions of these kind of beliefs seem to be established very early on in life. So these kind of beliefs that women are actually not as good in science or that we may not be as productive are actually still very much ingrained in the core of our society. And then the theoretical notion of what makes a good woman and what makes a good scientist is actually quite opposite. So a good woman is, for example, a little bit more quiet, a little bit sweeter, a little bit less out there as opposed to say whereas a good scientist would be bold and brave and very strong in his or her conclusions right and this kind of leads to this role incongruity as they call it that if you want to be a good woman by society standards you cannot at the same time be a good scientist and that's why usually when women do get quite far in jobs that are more considered male dominated jobs they are considered usually these women are considered a little bit more tough or a little bit more hardy or a little bit cold even and these are kind of characteristics we don't like to see in our mothers right or in the women that should raise our children so then the argument could also be posed in a manner that if we have more freedom in our choices a lot of women move away from choices that are better for us in an intellectual sense and more towards the role that we should supposed to be taking according to culture and even I see it a lot in women around me. So I think until the PhD level at the moment, at least in my institute, the male-female ratio is quite 50-50. But then when you continue afterwards, so towards the postdoc and then professorships, you actually see the female researchers drop out by large amounts. And this is usually because a lot of girls and women that I know do want to become a mother at a certain point. And there is still this assumption that a woman should take the primary care role for the child. And also a bigger problem is that usually when you get pregnant and afterwards give, a, give birth, this is quite a big burden on your body. So usually there's a rest period of about a year. But the period this takes place is usually between 30 and 35. And this is usually when a scientist really has to establish him or herself in the field. So the only option then for a woman is to or not become a mother and become a really well-known scientist or to drop science a little bit and go more towards motherhood. And I think because science is such a cutthroat field that at a certain point there is really a bottleneck towards certain jobs that this tiny difference of one year between men and women can really make a big difference. And I kind of want to end a little bit on this last note, and she also ended on this in her book, that nowadays in science we, we are moving a little bit more to gender, but also sex as more of a spectrum. So in 1993 there was this paper written called The Five Sexes. And five sexes is actually that between male and female there are more types of sexes that could be considered. But I also want to link to this channel that I really like called Jesse Gender for a little bit more an in-depth discussion about gender. Yeah, because gender and sex and sex being the biological side and gender being more the social side is really important. And I think it's a topic we kind of ignore a little bit in neuroscience because it's so entwined with our environment that we as scientists usually don't really want to burn ourselves on this topic. 
but I do recommend you to read the book, The Gendered Brain, if you wanna know a little bit more and have a really nuanced perspective of this super controversial topic. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you have any recommendations of what I should read next, I would love to hear them. So put them down below. And I also made a video of my favorite neuroscience books of 2021. So you can see them here. And otherwise, see you next week. Bye.